Here's a little aviation experiment that you can try at home. Go ahead and ask a friend or family member what they think the world's biggest plane is. Unless they're an aircraft aficionado, I'd bet that most of them will come to the same conclusion, the Airbus A380. And you couldn't really blame them for reaching that conclusion. The A380 is an absolute beast. Not only does it have the largest capacity of any commercial airliner, carrying over 500 passengers with ease, but it's also the only commercial jet that's a true double-decker. But the A380 isn't the world's biggest plane, and it's not even all that close. Compared to the plane that does hold the title, the A380 actually looks downright puny. So what exactly is this behemoth of a plane, and why haven't more people heard of it? Let me explain. Now, for us to really understand the world's biggest jet and why it exists, we're gonna have to open up the history books and take a closer look at the Cold War. The space race was arguably the defining battle of that era, with the Americans and Soviets squaring off to see who could put a man on the moon first. The general public was enthralled by this high stakes competition, and there was much celebration when the Apollo 11 astronauts successfully touched down on the moon's surface in 1969. But the fanfare was soon replaced by apathy, and public interest in spaceflight began to fade. NASA's Apollo missions were cut short. While 10 were originally planned, only 7 actually took place. Things were even worse on the Soviet side. Efforts to reach the moon were completely abandoned after their N1 moon rocket failed to reach orbit on 4 consecutive test flights. But even with interest waning and budgets fading, the space race didn't really end, it just moved into a new, more tactical phase. The Cold War was still very much alive, and both sides were keen on advancing surveillance capabilities. As such, their attention was now focused on placing fleets of military and spy satellites into low Earth orbit, in addition to building new space stations from which research could be conducted. Achieving these goals would require the development of new, rapidly reusable spacecraft. The existing moon rockets were too big, too expensive, and took too long to build to effectively carry out these missions. The Americans ended up designing the famed Space Shuttle to do the work, while the Soviets developed the lesser known Buran. Oddly enough, both launch platforms looked remarkably similar to one another. I'm not going to say who copied who, but the key takeaway is that they both built space planes. All of a sudden, both sides had reusable vehicles that could drive down cost as funding for spaceflight continued to shrink. The problem with these platforms, though, is that neither could actually function like a normal airplane would, even if they wanted to. The Space Shuttle's RS-25 engines were absolute gas guzzlers, meaning it had to be strapped to a massive external fuel tank and a pair of solid rocket motors to reach orbit. Even then, it burned through its fuel reserves in just a matter of minutes. The Buran, on the other hand, only had orbital maneuvering engines, meaning it had no way to produce meaningful levels of thrust on its own. Rather, it had to hitch a ride to space on the back of Russia's new Energia rocket. Ultimately, this meant that while both space planes could come in and land on a normal runway, they couldn't take off under their own power. This presented a logistical problem because these orbiters didn't always come back and land at their original launch site. This actually happened quite often with the space shuttle. In total, the shuttle made 54 landings at Edwards Air Force Base in California, about 2,500 miles away from its launch complex in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Without a way to relocate these vehicles, they would essentially remain stranded. As such, both the US and USSR had to come up with innovative ways to transport them over long distances. Transporting them on roads was a non-starter, since both craft had wide wingspans that would be prone to clipping objects like trees and light poles. Further, transporting them via boat proved to be too limiting and too slow. The only viable solution was by air, so each country developed air transport systems to move these massive machines. NASA's solution involved taking a 747 and re-engineering it to carry the space shuttle on its back. 
The Soviets took a similar approach, but rather than repurpose an existing airplane for the job, they built an all-new aircraft. That plane was the AN-225 Myria. Myria meaning dream in Ukrainian. And you guessed it, it's the world's biggest plane. Now, I want to throw some numbers at you to help you appreciate just how gargantuan this plane really is. The AN-225 is 276 feet nose to tail, nearly the length of an American football field. It's 60 feet tall, the height of a six-story building. It's got a wingspan that's 290 feet tip to tip, almost three times longer than that of an A320. It's got 32 wheels in its landing gear assembly, 10 more than what the A380 has, and it's got six turbofan engines, producing over 300,000 pounds of thrust at max takeoff setting. These numbers are staggering, but there's one final figure that might help to explain why you've never heard of this plane. One, there was only one AN-225 ever built. You see, the Buran was a victim of bad timing. It was an incredibly capable space plane, and in many ways was actually more advanced than the space shuttle. But the Soviet Union collapsed shortly after the Buran's first orbital flight in 1988. Funding for space missions completely disappeared, and while the Buran program was never officially cancelled, the spacecraft never flew again. As a result, the AN-225's primary use case was no longer viable. But rather than be tossed on the scrap heap, the AN-225 was repurposed. After sitting idle for a few years, its engines were swapped out and it underwent substantial heavy lift modifications in order to make it a cargo jet. And because of its sheer size, it's been able to do some pretty remarkable things in that role, and even holds several world records. For instance, it holds the record for the heaviest piece of air cargo ever delivered, the longest piece of air cargo ever delivered, and the heaviest total payload ever carried. It's also been a boon for disaster relief efforts, playing a critical role in getting massive quantities of supplies to areas of need. Most recently, it's played a critical role in the fight against COVID-19 by delivering medical supplies from China to the rest of the world. You can pretty easily make the case that the 225 has been even more productive in its second life. And because of that, there's long been an effort to build more. Back in 2006, the Antonov company greenlit the production of a second unit. However, thanks to financing and sourcing issues, the build process has been mothballed for years and program ownership has changed several times. As it stands today, that second AN-225 sits at about 60% completion in a hangar on the outskirts of Kiev. It remains uncertain whether or not that second unit will ever be completed. Antonov insists that even though the plane has been sitting idle for quite some time, it remains in mint condition. However, it's estimated that finishing the project would cost a whopping $300 million, money that Antonov simply doesn't have. Now, there has been outside interest in helping to complete the project, primarily from Chinese investors and even a little bit of interest from Boeing but logistical and manufacturing issues still stand in the way of its completion. Regardless of whether or not this second unit is ever complete, the one that is in operation today will likely stay in operation for years to come. The plane is now over 30 years old, which for most aircraft is ancient. But since the 225 has a niche purpose and doesn't fly all that often, it's a lot less expensive to maintain than you might imagine. When you pair that with its immaculate safety record, there is simply no reason to usher in retirement despite its advanced age. Now, there have been a few challengers in recent years to the title of world's largest plane, most notable of which is the Strato Launch. This funky looking jet is designed to launch hypersonic test planes and rockets, similar to the Virgin Orbit 747 that I covered in a recent video. While this plane does have a wingspan that's 60% bigger than the 225, it's also shorter in length and has a slightly lower payload capacity. But what's most important though is that the Strato Launch isn't operational. While the 225 has been flying cargo missions for years, the Strato Launch has only conducted a single test flight. What's more, there's been a constant stream of rumors that Strato Launch is on the brink of shutting down and selling off its IP. 
Regardless of whether or not Strata Launch fails, it's undeniable that the 225 has succeeded. What could have been just a relic of a failed space program has reinvented itself to become one of the most unique and important aircraft flying today. And it's very much deserving of the title of the world's largest plane. So what's the biggest plane that you guys have ever seen in person? I personally have not seen the AN-225, but I have seen its little brother, the AN-124. That plane is closer in size to a 747, which is still huge, but apparently it still pales in comparison to the 225. Oh, and for those eagle-eyed folks out there, yes, the plane in the thumbnail is an AN-124, not an AN-225. They do look very similar though, so good work in recognizing the difference. Thanks so much to my patrons for making this video possible, and as always, if you learned something new today, leave a like and subscribe to keep learning. And, till I see you again, don't forget to look up.